Welcome everyone, good to see those names coming into the webinar and it's webinar number 292. So we're edging up towards the magic triple century mark. Uh, today we have with us Ying Yi Ma, who's going to talk to us about Chinese college students in the United States. So two topics we often explore in the webinars, Chinese students abroad and also higher education in the United States, topics now being pushed together by Ying Yi. Now Ying Yi is a professor of sociology and the Provost Faculty Fellow on Internationalization at Syracuse University. And the reason we're having today's webinar is that she's produced a recent book. Her monograph is called Ambitious and Anxious. Um, well, we're, we all know about that, both those things in higher education. So good words for us today. Uh, it won the best book award from the uh, Comparative and International Education Society Higher Education SIG Special Interest Group in 2021. And she's also a public intellectual fellow at the National Committee on US-China Relations. So she's close to things and US-China things and will tell us more about them. Um, let me take you through the webinar protocols before I hang up, hand over to Ying Yi. Uh, remember that the webinar is being recorded uh, and it'll be up on YouTube within, within the next day or so. Uh, you'll be able, be able to access it through our website. Um, and we'll also post the uh, conversation, the public conversation in the chat today on our website. Now, during the webinar, important to keep yourself muted because we occasionally do have extraneous noise coming in and it does disrupt the webinar when it happens. No need to use your video either during the, during the webinar. And, but of course, both your audio and your video are desirable when you come into the Q and A part of our webinar, especially your audio. Um, now, to develop a question to enter the Q and A, uh, put your question or your statement about the presentation into the chat. And from the chat, I'll be able to select people to come into the Q and A part of the webinar, which is an important part. And we hope usually about 25, 30 minutes of the webinar will be devoted to discussion. Uh, when you're actually invited in, and I'll send you a warning um, message in the chat beforehand, when you're invited in, please remember to unmute yourself, most important, uh, switch on your video if you can, and then state your name and where you are from, and then launch into your question or statement. Yingyi, it's a pleasure to hand over to you at this point, and the screen is yours. Great, Simon, very, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to um, this wonderful group. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen now. And if, can you see my full screen? You've started screen sharing, but we're still waiting for it to appear. Ah, there we are now. We All right, see. great. All right, so um, as Simon said, this is my book cover, Ambitious and Anxious. Um, it was published by Columbia University Press in 2020. And um, again, I am a, a professor of sociology at Syracuse University. And to start, I want to... Uh, really give you some kinds of a, a macro enrollment data from the United States, um, which is really comparing the dramatic increase of Chinese undergraduate students compared to graduate students. As you can see, both of the two groups has grown dramatically, but the growth for undergraduate students is even more phenomenal and remarkable than uh, graduate students. And around 2014, undergraduate students has surpassed graduate students, has become the majority of um, Chinese international students population in the United States and has continued to stay in this way. And um, a lot of people notice that uh, Trump administration has uh, witnessed the overall decline of international students population because of uh, his well-known rhetoric of against um, international students, but Chinese students continue to grow actually uh, under his reign. And Chinese students uh, really start to uh, stop the growth during the pandemic. 
And it seems that uh, in most recent data shows that international students' enrollments uh, start to bounce back last year in 2021, but Chinese students uh, have not really bounced back. There, there is continuing a drop, a 18% drop of Chinese applicants in 2021, and we continue to see the decline. But the absolute number uh, Chinese students still remain the largest. And so this is the top five sending countries of undergraduate students to the United States. You can see that before China uh, has become the number one sending country around, which is around 20, uh, 2010, South Korea is actually the number one sending country. Okay, um, so here is the interesting uh, graph I want you to pay close attention to, which is uh, what is the turning point uh, that um, for undergraduate students uh, from China, the growth rates, uh, it's actually uh, was, was the highest before the financial crisis. It was, uh, it was during the 20, 26, uh, 2006 to 2007 academic year. And a lot of people uh, was thinking that um, pandemic, uh, the financial crisis is actually um, was a turning point. Actually it was not. In other words, there are a couple of social forces um, before the financial crisis that really give a rise to this um, skyrocketing growth of Chinese undergraduate students. So I noticed the two uh, factors here that people uh, neglect. One is the relaxing student visa policies during the second term of the George W. Bush administration, which is really uh, the policy, uh, correct, corrected policy after uh, the September 11th, uh, the George W. Bush administration, the first term have seen the dramatic decline of international students, especially from the Middle East. And then um, the then Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice has, has, has corrected the course and largely actually influenced the Chinese international students who, who have seen their visa rejection rate uh, significantly going down. The second social force is the uh, RMB, the Chinese currency have uh, appreciated by 36% from 2005 to 2014. That period also overlapped with the you know, the, this enormous growth of Chinese uh, students and un undergraduate students uh, who are largely full pay students in the United States higher education. So um, here are some of the media headlines um, was actually reported before I published my book, um, which also motivated my research uh, because I found the media coverage has been pretty unidimensional, um, captivating the sensational terms such as the, the gold generation, uh, the luxury spending and so on and so forth. So I wanna move beyond this unidimensional and dehumanizing coverage in the media. And sometimes the media coverage coverage has also been uh, very negatively uh, portraying Chinese students as uh, cheaters and you know, violators of academic integrity. Um, and I know that um, the, this population is very, very diverse and I wanna present a more balanced and nuanced portrait through a more systematic research. And, and that really requires a diverse set of Chinese students. And the diversity that I focus on really um, um, have centered on two dimensions. One is the socioeconomic backgrounds, um, the family backgrounds, and the other is educational backgrounds um, in terms of how uh, they travel, um, the kinds of education trajectory they travel from China to the United States. So the book has uh, followed the life course perspective uh, in terms of divide dividing their experiences into two stages uh, before arrival in terms of um, how and why they choose to study in the United States. Um, and that really focus on their uh, different educational trajectories. And uh, after arrival, I focus on their educational and um, social experiences in terms of college major choices, in terms of their own reflections about how their prior schooling in China has helped or hurt them in their education in the United States. Um, and also in terms of their college major choices, um, what kinds of uh, socialization and values in both China and the United States influence their choices. And also, of course, their social experiences, their um, 
you know, to what extent they make American friends, what are the barriers? And the third segment uh, in terms of examining their reflections, how do their study in the, in the United States change them? And how do they plan ahead, uh, deliberate about their future place of living? So if you're looking at all these kinds of questions, um, I have to use mixed method methodology to address those questions. Some of the questions cannot be addressed with survey data alone. Therefore, I, I was using mixed method research. Uh, some of the main findings are listed here. I do not have time, of course, within the one hour to go over them. Um, we have, I have 10 chapters in the book. And overall, the main findings really um, reflect the, the title of the book, which is the duality of ambition and, and, and anxiety really define this generation of Chinese students, which I would argue really reflect the transformative changes happening in China. So as I said, uh, I have used the mixed method research in my uh, research design. And um, I've drawn macro level data from uh, both the Chinese Ministry of Education and the Institute of International Education in the United States. I've also collected um, individual level survey data, sort of micro level data, as, as, as well as uh, conducting in-depth interviews. Um, I've also conducted field work in seven Chinese public high schools with international divisions and one private school in six cities from 2012 to 20. Uh, 18, so six years, six summers, including one sabbatical uh, doing that. And that really helped me understand the different trajectories of, um, of Chinese students who have diverse backgrounds coming here to the United States. Also this part I will revisit uh, in my finding section reflect a very important educational reform in current China, which is so-called a uh, international division in Chinese public schools. All right, so here is my data. I've conducted uh, 108 uh, in-depth interviews um, and I've also um, um, collected uh, 507 online surveys from 50 colleges and universities, uh, which is a range of universities. Um, and this is my survey sample characteristics. Um, especially I wanna highlight that this is a very uh, urban population, 94.5% of the students are coming from the cities. Study abroad, uh, as I've argued in the book, is uh, still a largely a privileged um, a privileged uh, phenomenon, you know, for privileged segment of Chinese society. But, you know, among the privileged segment, they're still diverse in terms of their parents' educational and occupational background. Their parents' educational background, as you can see, still highly privileged, a lot of them having college and even graduate education. But I, the part uh, that the yellow part I highlight really shows this, what I would call, um, the, the higher education uh, literature in the West would call the first generation college students. So this segment actually uh, has been found in my research, um, really showing some distinct disadvantages in terms of their social and academic behaviors. And also arrival time in the United States, um, showing that some of them uh, arrive here in the high school and some of them arrive here, most of them arrive here uh, as, a, as, a, as a college uh, first year student. And a, a, a minority of them transferred from Chinese colleges through exchange programs and then they stay here, okay? So, um, all right. And um, their perceived English is also pretty diverse and finance education uh, is not diverse. Uh, 90, close to 92% uh, of them use family funds uh, to fund their education. And uh, among my participants, um, 41% coming from selective institutions, uh, which includes the first uh, 50 national major universities and the top uh, 20 small liberal arts colleges. And I use this definition defined by my participants. You know, when I was asking them, what do you think uh, constitute the selective institutions? So overwhelmingly, they're looking at uh, the top 50, the top 50 major university and the top 20 liberal arts colleges. All right, so when I was talking about 
their education and their parents' education, occupational diversity. Um, here is the data really shows the, their parents, their both their mothers and fathers' occupations, and as you can see, um, you know, women's um, Chinese mother labor force participation rate is really high. So most of their parents, their mothers are working. And uh, look at their parents' occupation. It's very interesting. Um, you know, I, 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 I want to highlight in particular, um, many of them are professors, okay, for both fathers and mothers. Um, and, you know, most of the professions, as you can see, are uh, white collar middle class um, jobs. So they're not just from CEOs and super rich uh, wealthy households. And I, you know, as a professor, I'm especially intrigued by such a large number of uh, professors sending their own kids abroad, uh, skipping their um, Chinese higher education. Uh, and that I was able to get some insights from the interviews. Some of the um, some of the professors' children uh, specifically worded that their parents have some firsthand knowledge about Chinese higher education, especially during um, the transformative changes. The Chinese higher education trying to push into the world class universities has this transition, very strong emphasis on research and publications that they very much neglect undergraduate instruction. So they think that their children uh, had better go abroad, study abroad, and the United States has been found to be uh, oftentimes the best place for them to go. Well, that may change, um, and we can engage that um, post, uh, post pandemic uh, in the Q&A. So when we're talking about um, most of the students are from the privileged upper middle class families, I still want to highlight a few cases I found, especially in my interviews, students from working class background. Here is a student, um, I call him Peter. Uh, from Shanghai. His father is a driver. His mom is a cashier, a, a, a typical working class household in Shanghai. And uh, some of the lifestyle and behavioral uh, indicators also shows that their families are really um, from humble beginnings. Uh, Peter had never boarded a plane, neither um, neither do um, his parents, even his father was a driver, uh, always regularly driving back and forth uh, between airport, but he himself has never boarded a plane. But Peter first time took the plane, that's because he needs to take SAT in Hong Kong. Okay, so then the natural reason, natural question for me, uh, and for probably all of you is how could the family possibly afford the education uh, for Peter, that um, he finally went to University of California in San Diego. And the reason that the family could afford is uh, that the family selling their only apartment in downtown uh, Shanghai and using the grandmother's uh, housing subsidy from the government to move to the margin of the city. In other words, uh, the three generation are squeezing to a tiny apartment in the margin of the city in exchange for um, their only wealth of the downtown apartment, um, really out of um, his father's um, a company's um, old apartment building um, and based on the skyrocketing well, real, real estate appreciation. So because of that, they're able to um, afford St. Peter abroad. And also his parents take a lot of, you know, borrowed a lot of money from, from, from extended families. So Peter's example illustrates um, and along with um, this large segment of upper middle class families in, in China that uh, at least before the pandemic, study abroad has become the new education gospel in urban China. So the working class children like Peter really are heavily influenced by these kinds of gospel uh, defined by upper middle class um, kids in a mega city such as Beijing and Shanghai and has permeated to uh, lower tiered cities in China as well. That they realize that study abroad can liberate them from several things. One is they can rescue them from their undesirable Gaokao scores. And for some of them, they up, up out of Daoka altogether. Um, and for others, um, especially for professors, uh, uh, professors' children, uh, some of them do have a good access to uh, quality higher education. They don't really want 
to go through a Chinese um, test oriented education system. So they want to be liberated uh, from oppressive test oriented education system in China. So this is uh, one of the arguments in my book that if Gaokao used to be uh, the education gospel uh, providing social mobility um, now or over the past 20 years, study abroad has become the new one for kids in urban China. And some of the misconceptions that's, that people are having about higher education in China is that so many students try to study abroad is because higher education access in China is, uh, is limited. Uh, but quite in the contrary, higher education access in China over the past two decades uh, was, was very much expanded, but the problem is it's heavily stratified. So um, higher education has uh, in China has become the largest system surpassing the United States in the total higher education enrollment starting in 2004. But it's highly stratified uh, and leading to uh, a few top schools extremely competitive to get into. And that large uh, enrollment in higher education, sort of getting to higher education specialists called that massification of higher education has produced unintended consequences, which is a dire college graduation labor markets. I think this year in particular, the most recent news I've seen is 70% of college graduates have not really uh, landed a job. So then, you know, students um, have to resort to some other means to increase their competitive advantages. And one of them is really trying to uh, study abroad. So this table is uh, uh, the data I've collected from Tsinghua University's admissions office, uh, basically just highlighting how competitive it is to get into a university like Tsinghua. It is more competitive, 10 times more. When we're talking about Ivy League, such as Harvard, uh, Yale, and Princeton, their admissions rate is less than 5%. And, and look at Tsinghua, and even for students from Beijing, it is uh, exceedingly low. So all of that really drive uh, students um, who have high ambitions to go into top ranking universities, sort of top ranking world-class universities to study abroad, not only in the, in the United States, but also in the UK. So my survey data shows that uh, the factors in the choice of college in the US uh, overwhelmingly dwell on the ranking. Parental suggestions oftentimes converge on ranking, except you know with some of the um, uh, uh, very few cases that some of the parents have intimate knowledge about certain institutions or they have close family or friends living in that, in, in that university. So they would not prioritize ranking in their college choice. Okay, so uh, ranking does not uh, only drives college choice, but also drives school transfer. So in other words, when students even arrive in the United States, uh, they uh, take advantage of uh, the flexible transfer program. So all the cases that I've collected and I listed here in my interviews showing that um, their transfer trajectories is moving from the lower tiered college to a higher tiered college. All right, so um, I was talking about um, the research I've done in China, the, the field work I've done in Chinese um, um, public high schools with international divisions. So I listed here. So this is one of the one of the four education trajectories students travel to the U.S. So the first is they graduate from the regular Chinese public schools and then directly apply and getting admitted, enrolled in American college. The second is they opt out of um, Chinese Gaokao and enrolled in the international division in Chinese public schools. And so they use, you know, like two or three years um, with a lot of English instruction, with a lot of English speaking teachers, and then they apply to American colleges. And the third is they enroll in Chinese private schools. And, and I actually talk at length um, in my books about one private schools um, that, you know, direct, in, um, has, is, have established some kind of institutional partnership with American colleges, but those private schools are very, very few, and a lot of Chinese students and their parents do not really have a lot of trust in those schools. 
And number four is um, rising in numbers over the past few years, especially before the pandemic, is students directly arrive in high schools in America, especially private boarding schools, and then they apply from there to American, co co to American colleges. From my research, um, close to 80% of the survey respondents traveled while the first and second pathway, so in other words, they stayed in China uh, before they enrolled in American higher education. So um, the very important uh, themes I've um, written in my book is social class and social reproduction. No surprise, I'm a sociologist. And um, so here it's very interesting that um, I'm studying a, a privileged population. There's still, so here social class is really the first generation college students. And I found that um, they are at a distinct disadvantage in several ways. Um, in terms of uh, selective institutions and college placement, also in terms of um, academic integration, in terms of speaking up in classrooms, also in terms of social integration, in terms of having close American friends. So a couple, um, those, so this is our just um, statistics showing the results um, that support the findings I was just talking about, the first generation college students uh, disadvantages in academic and social outcomes. So I will skip uh, going to details and I will move ahead with uh, this, this part of the field work I've done, which is really the kinds of new programs, um, the international divisions uh, that teach international curriculum. And that include three types of curriculum, British A-level, uh, American AP, and um, IB curriculum, uh, International Baccalaureate, and prepare students to study abroad. So in all those uh, high schools that I've conducted field work, um, they have two tiers of uh, admission process. One is they ask students to take uh, the admission tests that uh, is widely administered among all the um, junior uh, junior or middle school students uh, getting admission into high school students. And they also have interviews. The interviews are all conducted in English. Some of the interviews uh, were even having with, with parents. And they charge as much as $15,000 uh, for annual tuition, which is really comparable to private school here in the United States. And um, in all those um, in all those public high schools that I conducted field work uh, in, with international division, students usually opt out of Gaoka. So uh, I've I've tried to do done some research. When did this start? It really started from um, Beijing in, around 2003, 2004, and I started uh, in the the field work in 2012. At that time, there are like a couple dozen, and now it's. It's, it's a couple hundreds of those kinds of uh, uh, schools. And um, so the, you know, here I was having uh, some of the data about the uh, interview process and uh, some of the interviews are even with um, parents. And uh, the school that have an interview with parents are in Beijing, it's a highly prestigious. And I was asking, I was interviewing the division head why they want to have interviews with parents. And this is a, what, they're saying they do not want parents who are authoritarian and controlling. This will not help their children succeed in the United States. So this is a sort of a testing for the parenting style and trying to get away from so-called Chinese, uh, traditional Chinese parenting. And uh, when I was starting the, before I uh, went into the field, I was um, having sort of this uh, quasi hypothesis feeling that if the students are opting out of Daokao, probably uh, the testing culture is alleviated. But my finding shows quite the contrary. Daokao is placed by uh, new tests, TOEFL, SAT, AP, British A-level, and more tests because those students take those tests multiple times. Um, and um, as you can see, recently just, just a, a news broke out that um, some of the cities, because of the lockdown, pandemic lockdown, uh, has uh, uh, canceled the a a AP test. And the parents were like uh, extremely anxious. Okay, so um, 
And I was wondering why, if the college admissions are not uh, placing exclusive attention on test scores, such as Gaokao, why students are and their parents are still so anxious about their test scores? Because the perception is the threshold for college admissions in the United States are getting higher and higher. So that's uh, the interviews I've had with the director of college counseling in one of the high schools in Beijing. So what I found is this uh, uh, paradox of educational desires through their attitudes towards test scores. Because on one hand, uh, if you're talking to those students and their parents, uh, as I said, one of the major reasons they want to get out of China to study in the United States is because they want to escape from the high stakes testing. They, they, they want to escape from the test oriented system. But at the same time, they have this strong education desire to get the highest test scores possible to get into the system that is supposed to be not really emphasizing tests. So, so this is what I would call the, the paradox here. So overall, um, I found, uh, you know, the ambition and anxiety define the experiences of this new wave of Chinese undergraduate students abroad. And uh, the gap between this, the two systems create a large void and I haven't really talked. And I know that some of the new research focusing on education agents actually can shed more light on that. And so in my book, I was talking because there is such a void, education agents step in the void. And because I, in my book, I really place a big part on, uh, in terms of the failure of uh, the lack of outreach of American higher education institutions directly to Chinese students and their families. That also created a lot of um, um, exploit, exploitative opportunities for, for profit agents to take advantage of that, okay? So in the end, I um, have some a series of uh, uh, policy implications for American universities, hopefully for British universities as well, that they need to be more proactive in reaching out directly. And they need to provide more systematic and sustainable support, especially for first generation uh, students. So questions for future studies. Um, I'm now working on a new paper really uh, systematically uh, interrogating this notion of privilege uh, when we study international students, because the notion of privilege is very much informed by the Western scholarship studying students in the West, uh, entirely socialized in the West. Um, and the second is how to really evaluate merit in the cross-national context of different education systems when they reward different kinds of abilities and attitudes. And when students cross the border and they're evaluated in different ways, how can we really help students and support them in understanding uh, their prior educational backgrounds? So those are the 10 chapters of my book. I'm very much interested in uh, in addressing all of your comments and questions. Simon, back to you. I hope I half an hour, great. Thank you, Yingyi, that was very interesting. Uh, and thank you for being economical with the time. So we have a bit of time to discuss now, folks, it's time to put forward your best ideas in the chat. Um, and uh, we have a question from Phil Altback. I might, before I bring in Phil, I might ask um, one myself. Uh, the big question, the geopolitical tensions, we haven't, we haven't addressed those yet in this discussion properly. Uh, I mean, there was that fall in numbers in, 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 uh, in, in the US, despite the general rise in international. On the late, latest consolidated data we have in relation to the UK, again, a general rise in international in the first year of the pandemic, 2021. Um, uh, but numbers from China fell by 5,000. And we think that in the subsequent year, further falls occurred, although international student numbers in general in the UK are going up. The, um, in fact, it's India is surging, although it's still only you know, half the level of, slightly over half the level of the, the China entry. So do you think we have a problem here? Um, how do we address this problem? Um, and the other question I wanted to ask you quickly was, um, getting 
English speaking and other Western students to go to China? You know, what can we do there? Um, I mean, there's a question of whether, you know, that's a desirable thing uh, for, from China's point of view, whether it does it want to have more foreign students come into China to study? How would we make that happen? I mean, I noticed that um, uh, some universities are more international than others, and we've just seen a withdrawal of Renmin, Nanjing, and Lanzhou from the global rankings um, uh, world, and that may indicate something of a turning inwards at those important universities, I mean, Nanjing in particular, um, very interesting. So where are we at with the geopolitics? Well, great. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, all are highly significant questions. Um, I think for your first question, uh, I do believe that during the US-China tensions and all of the uh, bad news from the United States in terms of um, you know, the, 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 the safety issues, um, especially the gun problems, the crimes, and most recently, just last year, there is a, uh, there is a very high profile media coverage about uh, University of Chicago Chinese students uh, was, was murdered and um, uh, her, 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 his mom was, was coming was traveling to the uh, to the uni to the University of Chicago to attend his funeral and the, this whole process was was uh, circulated on social media so that really sends a chilling message uh, to China and so I think, the throughout the process, probably several other countries are picking up the loss of international students um, to the United States. Um, the United Kingdom may be the biggest winner. <clears throat> and um, so I think, you know, uh, and other places that adjacent to Asia also picking up um, international students um, as well. But absolute number wise. Uh, I, I think we have to make the distinction in terms of the relative and the absolute number. The absolute number Chinese international students um, will still choose the US. So the US will still be the top destination of Chinese international students, I think, for the foreseeable future, unless the US and China cut off politically, uh, or there is any kind of strict policy, I don't really think it will, uh, especially the Biden administration is uh, very much um, pro international students. Uh, there is a recent uh, new policy that expanding um, a STEM OPT list uh, for people who are not so aware of the uh, OPT policy in the United States. So for international students, they have this one year of optional practical training. Um, for all international students. But for STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematics fields, uh, they have 36 months. In other words, three years of optional practical training. So basically, you don't need to have any employer to sponsor you a working visa. You can legally work in the United States after graduation for three years if you are in STEM field. So now a lot of majors who are not exactly science, engineering, mathematics. Uh, what about like, let's say statistics? What about uh, like data analytics? Uh, a lot of those, what about forestry, right? So a lot of those fields who are, uh, who are trying to get the STEM designation. So recently Biden administration is trying to meeting up this demand and expanding the list of STEM uh, designations. So making international students um, having an easier time to work a longer period for three years. Uh, so that's good news. Um, but but I, I think relatively speaking, uh, the, the growth rate of international students from China, as I have reviewed over the past from 2005 to 2015, that growth spurt has passed. So that's number one. Number two, uh, Simon, you're asking a, a terrific question. That's actually my, my research interest now, which is uh, international students in China. And I've collaborated with uh, Chinese colleagues there uh, about this. And right now, before the pandemic, uh, there has been half a million, half a million international students uh, in China. And um, you're right. The students actually from the West, including the United States, and the UK are actually declining. 
uh, with the rise of in general trend of rise of international students in China, uh, international students from the West uh, tend not to go to China anymore. And, and that's a very interesting, um, that's a very, very interesting pattern. And uh, President Obama has this uh, uh, what 100,000 strong program. That program was not successful. That program was not successful at all in terms of attracting American students to China. How can we attract more uh, international students to China? That's that's a very difficult question. I don't really know. I, I, I think, uh, at least from my vantage point in the United States, it's getting extremely, increasingly unlikely because if you're looking at the Pew Research data, the, the public sentiment uh, against China is, is getting skyrocketingly high. Close to 80% of American public have a negative view about China. Um, so how could American students uh, are interested in going in study abroad in China when the, the general public sentiment is so negative um, about China. So, so this is a, a really a, a broader question of why. I think going back to Simon, your point, this is about geopolitical dynamic that uh, the US-China rivalry, uh, the US-China um, even hostility is not amenable for students in the United States or in the West in general to be interested in studying abroad in China. That's why right now, most of international students in China uh, are still from Asia and the rise of international students, the percentage of growth are largely in global South, including Africa. Yingyi, thanks for that comprehensive answer. And I'd delight to bring in Phil Altback at this point. He's got a couple of questions. Yes, thank, thank you very much uh, for this really um, uh, interesting and significant um, uh, talk and book. Um, I have two questions which are really the same question. D do you have any sense um, uh, uh, among the undergraduate students as, as to how many of them or is it predominant interest uh, to remain outside of China and particularly in the US when they finish their studies? In other words, how is the desire for immigration uh, an aspect of, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, pushing uh, international uh, student mobility from China? And the other one is directly related concerning PhD holders. There's a, you know, a, a number of studies from uh, uh, the National Academy of Sciences and other places in the US that indicate that about 70% of PhD graduates from both China and India uh, remain in the US or other foreign countries. Do you think that's true? Um, and is, it, is that changing? And is the pattern for among undergraduates, which has been reported in the, in the press a bit, um, that more and more Chinese students are choosing to go back home, undergraduates that is, thanks. Thank you, Phil. Thank you for coming to my talk. These are great questions. And I address that question in terms of the stay versus return uh, in one chapter of my book. And um, the undergraduate, so, so my simple answer to your question is the undergraduate student population stay rate is much lower than doctoral students. Um, I think you're absolutely right the, uh, to cite the National Science Foundation. They have a, a very good survey called Survey of Earned Doctorates, which is, uh, which is the largest uh, national survey. And I hope that they have the survey for undergraduate students as well. They don't, they only track doctoral students. And actually the stay rate for doctoral students from China is phenomenally high, it's over 90%. Um, 10 years ago is getting a little bit uh, lower now, but it still is over 80%. China and India, you're right, tops the chart, uh, but overall doctoral students stay rate are much higher, I think for across the board for different countries origins than lower uh, degree holders. So according to my survey analysis, uh, most, actually 60% of undergraduate students um, actually have the plan to return to China. Uh, 
And that is oftentimes uh, after getting graduate degree. So they don't, a lot of them don't really plan to get a PhD. They, they plan to get a master's degree. And uh, it's very interesting that I, I reported in my book that uh, some students even uh, try to get a master's degree and in order to return to China. Uh, the reason is that they don't really think undergraduate degree uh, from American universities not sufficient, sufficiently competitive in the Chinese labor market. So when they go, go on to get a master's degree, oftentimes they also beefen up their prestige, their institutional prestige. Like for example, I have several students at Syracuse. Uh, we are um, relatively selective, but, but, but not the top tier institutions. So they went on to get a master's degree from NYU several of them having this trajectory of having a first degree from Syracuse, master's degree from NYU, and then return to Shanghai to get a job in finance or journalism and so on, so forth. But for doctoral degree, the stay rate is still pretty high. And Phil, you're right. Um, they are more likely, even for doctoral graduates, they're more likely than a generation ago to return to China because of um, a much more competitive pay than before uh, and better uh, opportunities. But there also, uh, uh, there, is a, there is a difference in terms of fields of study. Um, the, uh, the STEM fields um, have a higher stay rate uh, as always because there's more job opportunities and in the United States and uh, humanities and social, social science have a lower stay rate. So, so it's important to pay attention to that as well. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you both. Um, can we bring in Simon Chan now? Simon. Hello, Simon. I can see Simon's name there and he's answered me in the chat. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you, for, uh, Professor Ma. Thank you for your uh, lecturing. Uh, and after, after your uh, lecture, uh, I have one question. To, uh, I want to ask that you mentioned that uh, you suggest that uh, the US or British universities uh, could uh, provide some systematic support to the first generation students uh, who, who are going to study abroad. So I want to uh, note uh, what kind of uh, systematic support that the universities uh, could provide for the first generation students. Yeah, thank you. Great, so the first generation students here is uh, defined in just as the general higher education, higher education literature in terms of their parents have never been to college. So I think uh, I captured this very distinct population that um, their parents have never been to college and they have sent their kids not only to college for the first time, but also to college abroad. Um, so this is a really a double um, sort of uh, challenges that um, have not really been identified or even addressed by American institutions. And the reason being they are, as I said, economically privileged, right? So based on the institutional data, they would really consider them not as marginalized or disadvantaged. So they're really left as in, in the institutional void of support. So in my book, I was talking about this this population being um, economically privileged, but socially and culturally uh, marginalized or disadvantaged. And this population needs systematic support in terms of um, more institutional awareness that uh, there exists this kinds of uh, student population, that they need a more of a kinds of um, uh, institutional platforms to help them make a friends um, instead of you know, uh, adopting this sink or swim in individualistic approach uh, to rely on their own initiatives. Um, I think they also need a more direct outreach um, to for the institutions to engage with uh, the students themselves and their families instead of letting them relying on the, st uh, the, the study abroad agents because these population um, is more vulnerable to exploitation by the agent as well. Unlike their uh, college educated parents, sometimes with uh, language and um, experience of 
working and studying abroad, those parents have more um, resources and cultural capital to make the judgment and make choices. Well, the first generation college students, they don't. Thank you for your question, Simon. And, and, and thank you, Yumi. Um, Golo Henseki is our next questioner. Golo's got a couple of questions. Um, thanks, Simon. Um, thank you for this very ins insightful talk. I um, am I actually online? My camera? Yes, I am. Yes. Okay. Yes, you are. Um, so fantastic. You, My questions are um, all coming from um, me. I'm having supervised a few undergraduate dissertations uh, from international students and all that and, and their undergraduate dissertations all reflecting on issues that you've touched on. It's a very hot topic among undergraduate students to reflect on their own education experience. So my first question is, seeing that academic prestige is so important, um, what role does it actually play? What do we know about its role in the recruitment process once um, Chinese students go back home? And is it actually does it actually matter or is it more a strong belief that it matters? Um, then my second one, my second question was about the access to international higher education as you detailed requires a lot of long-term strategizing. It's not like an ad hoc decision. That needs to be, a lot of things need to be in place. They need to be the right qualifications. And it's not just um, whether international or not international, even if you go to a UK or US university, you probably want to plan, plan ahead and, um, decide whether you go and do an A-level or GCS and GCSEs um, in, an, in a British international um, school branch or do an American qualification, high school qualification and so forth. Um, and then the last one, um, how does all of this family investment reflect on individual student sense of agency or the negotiation between individual students in individual student and their parents and families who um, put all this effort, money and time um, in, in preparing their children for to, to study abroad. Thank you very much, uh, Gola. Um, I may not really get all of your questions because you've covered a lot. Let me go back. Let, let me go back to your first one first. Um, so you're asking about prestige, right? The role of institutional prestige in recruitment. What do you mean by recruitment in terms of, are you talking about market. college recruitment or in, know, in the, are you talking about in job the market. market? In the job market, once once you graduate, um, how much does it signal? How important is it to get into the job market? Can you hear me? I think there is a, okay, all right. So uh, are you talking about job market? Uh, prestige. Okay. Yes. Um, actually, these are very closely linked. Um, I'm currently uh, co-editing a book on the uh, employer, international students' employ employability as well. So I think a lot of times um, higher education administrators have not really realized that a lot of international students, they make their college choices uh, with their employability in mind. So in other words, it is because there's consideration of what kinds of institutional uh, signaling uh, they will bring to the job market. They're gonna, uh, they're gonna choose this, uh, they're gonna choose this school. So um, you're raising this very important question. I think there are two parts. One is, is, is that normative or is that empirical, right? So uh, I think the, the empirical part really requires a lot of research in terms of deciding whether college prestige really influence the, um, the students' labor market uh, outcomes. And I think the data really shows uh, the answer is yes. And probably in China, increasingly uh, in China, probably more so than in the in the West, that um, the Chinese labor market is very stratified and um, stratified uh, along the higher education stratification. So the institutional prestige uh, matters a great deal in terms of what kind of job opportunities, what kind of locations students want to work. Um, so, so that really matters a lot. I don't really blame Chinese international students and their parents. It's, 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 it's wrong to think that it's only um, for their vanity or face that they emphasize so much on 
institutional prestige because it is mattered um, a lot with their, the whole opportunity structure in China. Okay, so that's number one. Number uh, two, um, I, I, I think I missed your second question. Let me address your third question in terms of the agency one, okay? Gala, I, I, I can go back to your second question uh, after the third question. Um, this agency question, I appreciate the answer because uh, there is quite a bit of agency uh, among international students that highly depends on uh, the family background, highly depends on the um, uh, what you know their parents' um, awareness, their education, their their occupation. Um, and sometimes their parents are, um, if they are very well educated, sometimes they're very, very controlling. So the for the first generation students, they, they actually have a lot of agency because their parents don't really know anything about it. Okay. So um, for the for the for the college ed educated parents, uh, they are uh, just acting like a lot of parents in the West. Uh, helicopter parents, very, very um, controlling, very involved, um, making a lot of decisions uh, for their children. Uh, but I think I have, uh, I very much uh, like Simon, your, uh, one of your former work in terms of really considering international students or international education as a self-formation experience. So I think a lot of students have gained agency, no matter what kinds of, um, previous experiences with their parents or with their schools in China, they have gained agency while study abroad. And so that I have explored um, extensively in my chapter when they reflect upon their previous uh, experiences and how study abroad have changed them. So a lot of students not necessarily like the US, but they all think they have grown. They all think they have grown more independent. They have, uh, they have thinking, uh, they have thinking that they have grown more, um, more freedom, and that freedom has uh, given them a lot of opportunity to grow. So that self formation, I think, is pretty universally shared among international students. Going back to your agency question, uh, do you want to repeat your second question? Oh, don't worry about it. Um, I think there are loads of other questions. I don't want to hook all the time. Much appreciated, Golo. You're quite right. We've got three more, and I don't think we're going to get everyone in. But our next question is from Bowen Jang, and she's already on screen. Bowen. Hi, Ruby. Um, hi. Um, I hope you enjoy your trip in Manchester. And I, I mean, I should have raised this question during your visit, but somehow I forgot. Uh, anyway, so I'm really interested in your um, talk in terms of the paradoxical experiences especially how Chinese students escape the test-oriented tradition in China, but just found out that in America and US, they also have to take a lot of exam examinations. So I'm just wondering, um, will they have the feeling of like, okay, this is not what I signed up for. I don't expect that to be happening. So does that kind of experience have um, a negative impact on their overseas experiences? I'm wondering you just have that kind of data and what is, what is your thought on it? Thank you. Thank you, Bowen. That's, that's a very um, significant point that I really wanna come across in my book that this paradox of education desire um, has definitely had some uh, negative experience on their, both their admission process as well as their study abroad experience. In terms of the admissions process, I think the paradox really arise out of um, the lack of familiarity with the American system. This so-called holistic admission system that does not really pinpoint what factor matters, like what weight, you know, Chinese students really want to have um, a very, very specific, uh, very clear, clear-minded understanding about what matters most. But nobody really is able to tell them the answer. You know, what about the personal statement? What about the essays? And they don't really have any kind of strong grip about those elusive um, standards. That's why they find that test scores are the only thing 
that I that is very fixed, that is very solid, that is very concrete, they can have a strong hold on. That's why they're heavily influenced on it, even though they don't really know um, to what extent they really matter. So that really hurts them in terms of, um, you know, the productivity, right? You know, the amount of time, the investment they have put into, uh, to what extent that really generate the kind of return. And in terms of, uh, their study, their learning experiences while abroad, I think they continue to bring this test-oriented mindset because American institutions have failed to really socialize them in terms of understanding their prior experiences that, for example, a lot of students don't really pay much attention to classroom discussion or they don't really know uh, how to really uh, boost their participation scores that they are very much heavily influenced, uh, invested in the final test, uh, which is not really sometimes the major part of their final grade. Or they're not very much uh, aware of how to build relationship with faculty, which is a huge uh, factor here in the West, uh, but they just want to have a good grade. And that's, again, I think heavily influenced by, by their prior learning as well. We're winding up, I think, pretty soon, Yingyi, but we'll bring in the last two questioners together. Okay. And we usually run about five minutes past the hour. Uh, so let me bring in B. Stephen first, I think new to our webinars. B. Stephen. Oh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. So I asked you two questions and I tried to combine them to, uh, to run out of this time. So the first of all, I thank you, Professor Ma Yingying, for your interesting book and today's presentation. It's really interesting. Uh, my two questions, uh, the first uh, is just based on the advantages of social or economic part-time jobs that international students may attend or participate in. Uh, did you find some evidence that your Chinese international students in America can participate in these uh, part-time jobs in the American society. Uh, second question is also drawn from the title of the book, Ambitious and Anxious. Uh, I would like to know if you have got some evidences that the stress or this anxiety may vary according to the student's academic degree or academic discipline. For instance, how far or how did you find the anxiety between undergraduate students vice masters or PhD students, as well as how do you find the anxiety between uh, maybe social science and humanities students vice uh, STEM-based students? Thank you very much. Okay, hold, hold that uh, question in your mind, Yingyi, and we'll bring in Lisa Su as well, who's got a couple of very interesting questions too. Lisa. Um, hi, thanks, uh, thanks. Uh, so my question, I also have two questions. One is uh, about the international schools in China, like recent years government has sort of tightened the policy on um, international department in public schools or private schools, like the, a lot of inter international schools have been asked to change their names. Um, like for example, like to change it, like very specific in the names. And also uh, another question about like English seems like has been discouraging uh, in compulsory education and also the double reduction policy, like a lot of training centers have been closed. Um, overall, it seems like there's been a kind of shift in like ideology or, you know, so would it, do you think that would, uh, um, how would that affect for um, the joint venture um, school cooperation in the future, and then also uh, would that keep more students to study in China and hence uh, affect the Chinese student outward mobility in the future? Yeah. Good. Well, thank you, Stephen, um, for your questions. <laughs> so, for you know, thank. Thank you for mentioning the book title, The Ambitious and Anxious. Really, you know, some of the many, actually, many people ask me this, um, this title. Um, some people would say, aren't all college students ambitious and anxious? Yes, they are. Actually, um, you know, I think international students probably share this, um, 
this duality of ambition and anxious, right? We're not the random, randomly selected among student population. Um, international students cross the borders, invested in their education, run the risk and getting away from their family. But I think this generation of Chinese international students, especially undergraduate students, um, they're particularly ambitious and anxious. The duality is even more prominent because they're coming from the transformative society of China. Um, you know, I think it's there's no denial that there's no other places in the world over the past few decades that have experienced the tremendous amount of social changes as in China. And this generation of Chinese um, students have been part of that change. So they bring that uh, duality to the United States as the international students. So I think that duality is pretty unique. Uh, so if you're asking me how they're different among them, I think they're different um, because I don't really study graduate students in my book. I only study undergraduate students. So I don't really have comparison between undergraduate and graduate students, but I do have comparison among different college majors. I think uh, students with uh, STEM fields are less anxious. They're probably as ambitious because their opportunities are more. I think students who study humanities and social science and arts, they're more anxious uh, and ambitious to some extent because STEM and business are the major, um, are the major majors, are the sort of normative college majors for Chinese students. That is, you know, basically approved by the society, by their parents, by their, by their networks. So if they choosing, let's say, sociology, you know, uh, or education or art, they're already ambitious enough to go against or deviate from the norm, but they're anxious because here the fields are very culturally contingent. It's very hard to look for opportunities or have opportunities uh, in their host country. And going back home, the opportunities are also fewer. So, so the anxiety is really driven by the question of whether I can reap the benefit or you know, I can make my study abroad, this huge amount of money in investment from my parents worth it. I, I think the anxiety is from there, okay? So your the part time job question, um, Stephen, is not uh, is not a, a major question in my book because international students in China are barred from uh, working off campus. They can only work on campus, and uh, their job opportunities are very limited. That's why you always can see them working in campus cafeteria. Uh, that's one of the few jobs they can land. And that's actually one of the sort of snippets I've written in my book to show that uh, they're not all like, you know, brat and spoiled kids. And a lot of them are trying to uh, make some pocket money to offset uh, the living costs. Okay. All right, Lisa, your question about um, this, um, this shift, and you're right, there is definitely a shift in Xi Jinping's uh, China. Uh, there is um, uh, trying to downplay the importance of English. Why I'm saying trying to, because I don't really think they're very effective. The middle class families are still heavily invested in English learning and instruction. And the double alleviation is, uh, uh, is a big hit against uh, the capital-driven companies and education markets is not alleviating middle-class and upper-middle-class educational desires at all because the competition, the competition, um, the game has not really changed. The competition is not really being lessened. So, um, so I think there is a quite bit of a shift and quite a bit of a, a uncertainty in the international education sector, that's for sure. I think that's even more driven by the pandemic uh, than Xi Jinping's politics. The pandemic has uh, forced and foremost uh, led many foreign teachers leave China. That's a huge problem. If you don't really have English speaking instructors, how can you have in international education, right? So um, I think that's really a worthy question and research question for people to study in terms of the future of the international education sector in China. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Simon. Thank you all. Yeah, well, thank you, Yingyi. That was a very stimulating um, presentation and discussion. And, you know, I think people will now read your book in greater numbers. And 
and the discussion will go on. So be welcome back again to our series when we've got more uh, books and more papers to bring forward uh, to the international audience. I think that everyone's interested in what you're talking about. I mean, it's impossible to avoid the impression that mobility is running into a different kind of period now. There's been some parting of the ways between the nation state and internationalization in many countries, not all perhaps, but I think mobility is now high volume and will continue for reasons you've given and others as well. Um, Chinese students have carried the largest part of that global mobility in the last few years. Uh, they've played a tremendously important role in bringing the world closer together. That shouldn't be underestimated or forgotten. That contribution to humanity is really, is really important, really significant. So these individuals pursuing their self-interest in their own lives are doing something more than just that. You know, they, they're actually joining the world together. Um, we'd all like to see them join that joining more deeper and more effective and more sustained than it is, but it's a completely different world to what it was 20 years ago. There's far more mobility in higher education. And I think one way or another, that's going to continue despite the fact that it's a more difficult period. Well, we certainly took talking about these issues further in future. Our next webinar goes to the question of intercultural relations and colonial imaginaries in, in international education. So our presenter will be Thishari Willakala and we will be able to see her on camera next Tuesday. Don't forget, uh, as Trevor has been reminding everyone at the webinar, CG conference is about to begin. We've passed 1000 registrations, but we're greedy and we would like more and more people to register for the conference and tune in on the 24th of May. We think it'll be a really interesting day. And again, that'll continue on the 25th. Looking forward to seeing you at the next webinar on, on uh, next Tuesday and also at the CG conference the following week. Bye for now.